Um, hello to all and uh, welcome to the joint Zendi and Intech Open webinar, uh, Emerging Technology Partnering for Accessibility, Discoverability and Sustainable Future. Uh, my name is uh, Victoria Shgela, I'm Head of Editorial Development at Intech Open. I would like to give a special uh, thanks to today's panelists. May I add, it is a pleasure to have an all-female uh, panel of experts of, I would say, uh, women in science and uh, women in business. Uh, we will hear today from Professor Tatiana Morozyuk from TU Berlin, who will present a hands-on case of research on one of emerging technologies in energy engineering and sustainability, uh, goal behind that research. Uh, she will be joined by Dr. Jo Haberman, uh, who will present her work on Africa Archive in the context of securing discoverability um, and accessibility of research. And last, we will hear from Monica Chinsami from Zendi, a part of Knowledge E, uh, who will present their work in achieving equitable access to the published research. Uh, I would like to use this opportunity to, um, to give a special hello to uh, Ms. Sara Crowley-Vigno from Zendi, who unfortunately couldn't join the webinar because of her illness. Um, may I add that uh, Intech Open and Knowledge as signatories to the UN's SDG Publishers Compact initiative are committed to promoting the content that advocates the teams represented through all uh, 70 sustainable development goals. And this webinar is part um, of these activities where we want to highlight the research and work that contributes uh, to achieving the overall sustainability goal and that addresses several SDGs in particular. I'm also glad that we have managed to gather a group of extraordinary speakers that wrap up the scholarly communication landscape from its uh, beginning, that is a development of, of idea that is translated into research and into a real world scenario, distributing that very uh, same research in its either development, develop, developmental phase or as the ultimate result in a form of a published work while at the same time securing the discoverability and um, maximizing its potential. Uh, before we start with the talks, may I just add that you are free to post questions to our panelists in the Q&A uh, section. Uh, we will try to uh, answer uh, them live. So, uh, without further ado, I would like to uh, present Professor Tatiana Morosiuk, who is a long-term Intech Open editor and author. I would like to say a supporter of Open Access Open Science. She is uh, head of the exergy-based methods for refrigeration systems department and the director of the Institute of Energy Engineering at TU uh, Berlin, Germany. And uh, Tatiana is the first female recipient of the James Harry Potter Gold Med Medal from the American Society of Mechanical Engineers uh, for outstanding and innovative contributions to the science of theoretical and applied thermodynamics. Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you very much for this possibility for me to participate in the webinar and give uh, the participants, mainly of course for young uh, participants, a view about emerging technologies um, that are supposed to be used and um, appreciated to be used for uh, energy sector. Uh, here in this slide, uh, well, there is only definition of what means emerging uh, technologies. In energy sector, we will refer to innovative and developing technologies uh, in related to all applications in energy sector that can uh, have potentially significant impact to all parts of energy sector, means generation of electrical energy, 
or, uh, dis distribution and also consumption. Mainly we will focus on electrical energy, but of course energy sector, it is not only electricity, it is also heat generation and now we have synergy with uh, chemical plants. It is also some chemical substances uh, generation. It is also beyond to emerging technologies. And briefly, I will cover today all these topics. At present, uh, energy sector is in the phase of transition. You know what means tra uh, transition. It is from the um, convention technologies, mainly focus on uh, fossil fuels, to the new, um, all new possible options. So when we discuss about emerging technologies, it's better always to uh, refer to technology, technology readiness level. It is um, quite old. Um, as a scale for uh, Europe, for European development, it is from one to nine, but uh, not very often people discuss it about uh, so-called uh, TRL level. But for us, it's very important to mention that all emerging technologies that we will today discuss and in general we will discuss, it is between level four and seven, because everything which is below four, it is level of of experiment, it is laboratory, difficult to, to discuss about even um, a small scale application. And eight to nine, it's already fully industrial technologies with small or large scale application depends on. So therefore, one more time, we will discuss about technologies beyond to the level between four and seven. So we have right part of this slide, we can see entire energy sector and divide it into three groups. First, it is conversion of primary energy through energy conversion process to energy carriers. It, it can be fuels, can be electricity, can be secondary fuels. For example, hydrogen belongs to the category of uh, secondary energy carriers, the same as diesel fuel, as gasoline, and so on. After that, we have transportation and distribution of energy. As you can see, it is not only electricity, but it is also can be chemical substances and fuel. And finally, we are with final energy consumption. Energy, final energy consumption, all of us were consumers, regardless if it is for residential use or for our business purposes, it, all of us are uh, consumers. Therefore, just for uh, simplification of discussion, let me start with the emerging technologies in final energy consumption to understand better what is happening with the generation. What about energy consumption? Let us look to the, uh, this very interesting, colorful um, uh, diagram, how uh, different technologies were developed, I mean, uh, with the time development, and how many uh, people, okay, percentage of the uh, population uh, got access to these technologies. As you can see, for example, with uh, TV, uh, okay, I will not take uh, electricity and airplane, telephone, because it is very old technologies, but at least with TV and with personal computers and so on, at least required 10, 15 years that these technologies came to the mass market so uh, that many people will have access to these uh, technologies. But these technologies are based on electricity. It means that elect uh, power sector, electric, electrical generation sector, had at least 10-15 years to adjust, to be prepared for more electri uh, electricity consumption because of new technologies. But look what happened with internet and particularly with digitalization. Digitalization concept just was developed and immediately was already accessible by many people. And during three, five years, we cannot make the decision about new power plants and how much energy, electrical energy we need to generate. In general, uh, all these uh, developments in digitalization belongs to category of e-mobility. So e-mobility, it is not only electrical cars, it is also smartphones, all sensors. Uh, so everything which is related to the word smart that now we are uh, 
mention. And uh, usually uh, people mention the period of time uh, between 2008 and 2018 is decade of immobility. So uh, 10 years ago, we had no idea what is it, uh, smartphones, I mean 2008 and 2018, uh, already almost each person uh, had um, smartphone and access uh, to the internet. Also, the same applied to the uh, levels of industry. As you know, now we're discussing about Industries 4.0. It is cyber physical systems fully related to the um, uh, control signals and so on. So all these technologies are required electricity. So it means that we have, we need to have very stable uh, supply of electricity reliable and also in um, amount that is required not for our everyday life with smartphones with tv and so on at home but also for industry next slide please thank you so now we will discuss about the distribution Be uh, between energy producer and energy consumer there is the energy distribution before, people only discussed it about the distribution of electrical energy through grid, but now more and more we need to discuss about gas distribution network. Before, it, it also exists, of course, but it was not so much uh, linked to other um, industries and also thermal distribution because we know different heating systems and even different uh, cooling systems for example in the middle east when they require more uh, air conditioning than of course than heating therefore uh, approximately 10 years ago came the idea uh, to have a um, statement and the, the definition of smart grids so smart grid, it is not electrical grid, it is also can be smart thermal grid and also smart gas grid. So it means that under smart, uh, we, uh, we should um, keep in mind that uh, possibility of combination of these grids with um, with supplier and with user of corresponding energy carrier and also synergy between grids and between um, supplier and uh, and users and all these smart stuff associated of course with energy consumption for the sensors for the distribution of information and of course finally everything will be linked to cyber security and the reliability of distribution information in order to make all these grids smart it is distribution. Now, next slide, please. We will discuss about energy, uh, so electrical energy generation, because electrical energy is very important for us, for each um, spheres of our activities. Let us assume that we have electrical energy. Somehow it is generated. And what we can say about electrical energy? Electrical energy itself, it is clean, flexible, secure, and reliable form of energy. This is correct. If we have electrical energy itself without discussion how to produce it. Electrical energy can be easily converted to any other form of energy with very high efficiency. Uh, any form of primary energy, if we will uh, look backwards to the um, this complex schematic that I showed a few slides before, any form of primary energy can be converted to electricity. And actually nuclear energy and renewable energy in large scale can be converted only to electricity because using uh, nuclear energy were not allowed to distribute heat because of risk of radiation and uh, renewable energy, for example, hydropower or wind energy, we cannot generate any other sort of energy except electrical energy. With sun energy, we have uh, different options. Also, 
um, if we have electrical energy, we can produce thermal energy at high temperatures. We will not discuss how useful is it or how expensive is it, but technically it is possible. And also, if we have electrical energy, we can have much more accurate uh, control and control strategy for the uh, for all power generation system and all power uh, consumption system. And um, uh, of course, environmental impact uh, through elect uh, because of electricity generation, usually uh, the higher uh, is the unit, the lower is the environmental impact. And this is a well-known phenomenon that if large capacity systems, of course, much more efficient and less environmentally, so more environmentally friendly, better to say like that, per unit of generated electricity, that small and local systems. So please, next slide. Positive aspects I already mentioned. In this slide, you can find all these positive uh, uh, aspects um, again uh, to follow, but we also have negative aspects. Always electrical energy is expensive. It can be very expensive. For example, in Germany, it is country with the most expensive electricity over all the world, one of the, uh, these countries. And in any other countries, electricity is always relative expensive. Uh, efficiency of electrical generation is still relatively low and not because we are not advanced. There are some thermodynamic limitations and we cannot overcome these limitations because of simply its physical uh, processes. And a really very uh, big negative aspect, storage of electrical um, energy in large capacities, in industrial capacities. Storage of electrical energy in small batteries, this is well known for us. It is well, well developed and um, with very good effectiveness, but for large capacity, up to now, it is not economically feasible. And of course, any of technologies that can help us to make it economically feasible should be um, not only developed, but also should be advanced. And also problems, uh, I already mentioned several problems related to electrical generation sector, but now I will... Uh, uh, summarize um, these problems that decision to build a new power plant requires time. And if we have this very fast developing uh, technologies that require electricity, and we cannot unfortunately predict when these technologies will come and how much electricity we will need to generate to fulfill uh, these technologies. Not easy to estimate future demand of electrical power. And up to now, we cannot see any of perspective to decrease electrical um, demand. Um, of course, electrical uh, prices for electricity should support all these uh, developments. And as I already mentioned, uh, now we have more and more new technologies that purely depends on electricity, not depends on any other forms of energy. Next slide, please. So we have very interesting diagram developed by International Energy Agency. And um, of course, it is with prognosis. Diagram was uh, created shortly uh, before um, pandemic time and energy saving. If it is energy saving, automatically it is re reduction of CO2 emissions and all other emissions associated with electrical generation. The largest contributor that uh, so which technology can help us to save energy and also reduce emissions it is technology switching it means that if we will develop a new technology or advanced um, well-known technologies to the large-scale application this is the, our way how to um, decrease primary energy consumption and exactly this uh, technologies are associated with the world emerging technologies. So please, next slide. Thank you. 
recently published World Energy Outlook. I think it was published uh, uh, at the end of um, October uh, 2023. There are very interesting three prognoses in the consumption of primary energy. So it means that energy that's applied to power systems to generate uh, finally electrical energy. We have one scenario that is mentioned that now annual grow in primary energy consumption, it is only 0 0.7 compared to the time before pandemic, it was 1.5% or 1.7%. Of course, depends on the scenario. One scenario say that it is almost flattened energy uh, primary energy demand, which is, uh, by my opinion, a fantastic achievement. And there is even one scenario that uh, showing that we have negative growth. The, this best situation cannot be, of course, that we have negative growth. So it means that we will generate more electricity. We will fulfill all electricity consumption, but uh, with reduced primary energy consumption. This is this is wonderful. But how can come uh, flattened scenario and negative growth? Because exactly implementation of new technologies of em emergency uh, emerging uh, technologies uh, that um, should be developed or adjusted to the large scale application and their alternatives. And exactly these technologies can help us to reduce CO2 emissions with the base case uh, to half to 50%. And uh, if it's stated now, at least one third definitely can be reduced because of these technologies. Next slide, please. So what is usually modern trend uh, associated with emerging technologies? Of course, it is renewable energy, but not renewable energy, uh, classical use, purely re renewable energy. It is implementation of renewable energy to the fossil fuel-based uh, power generation systems. It is necessary for grid, for stabilization of grid. Energy storage options. Again, we return it to nuclear energy. Uh, different countries with different um, opinion about that. For example, Germany said we will not return to nuclear energy unless it will be new, completely new technologies developed and brought to the market. But for example, France already mentioned that they will continue with re uh, nuclear energy and actually their idea to even more to move to nuclear energy because there are some advantages uh, to use nuclear energy. And carbon uh, capture and storage, this concept already people discussed it many years. There is successful practical application, but still it is uh, quite expensive. So it, uh, the problem with this concept, it is only the cost. Everything other is already well developed. And now I would like to show you some new concepts that can be part of this well-known concepts, mainly developed uh, in Germany to make this idea more, um, more prominent among international uh, society. Next slide, please. So uh, a few more words um, about um, still about CO2 emissions, we know that all CO2 emissions, in general, we need to divide um, uh, to, to, to groups, direct and indirect, even renewable energies associated with very low, but nevertheless, CO2 emissions, so called it indirect. Also, we need to distinguish between CO2 emissions emitted to the environment or all other emissions uh, that can be recalculated as equivalent of CO2 emissions. It is different. Uh, it is different topics to discuss about emissions. Sometimes it is confusing, but nevertheless, all these emerging technologies contributed to both direct emissions, indirect emissions, and equivalent CO2 emissions. Next slide, please. Yeah. Now regarding the storage. 
Left part, you can see all uh, possible at present um, options for storage of um, mainly electrical energy. We can move from the very low capacity, which is left part of this diagram, to very high industrial capacity, right part of this diagram, but also very important, the time of the storage, from seconds, minutes, to days, week, and even months, which is very uh, important for us because if we discuss about large capacity, industrial capacity, definitely it will be very right part of this diagram because we would like to have long-term storage. At least a few days or weeks, it is already belongs to the category of long-term uh, storage. And um, in the middle of this slide, you can see the table with uh, very interesting uh, information regarding the cost, uh, capacity, and so on, but technological readiness level. Only small capacities, storage available commercially, so it means bat battery storage. Everything which is large capacity, it is only uh, demonstration or under development technology. And some of these technologies uh, now really discuss it as emerging technologies. For example, which is called CES, it is compressed energy storage. Mainly it is associated with um, uh, with um, wind energy. Also, we have H2, it is generation of hydrogen and storage of hydrogen as energy carrier. We have also CAES, it is cryogenic energy uh, storage. And this diagram that you can see uh, on top, it is exactly beyond the category of liquid energy storage. So when we have excess of electricity, we can take air from the environment, liquefy air, and uh, liquefaction of air, it's, it's very low temperature, it's so-called cryogenic uh, temperature, store liquefied air, we can store it relative long period of time, and after that, through supplying very small amount of heat, maybe it is even uh, heat stored within the um, liquefaction process, we can regasify air, and generate electricity from that. So this is one of the technology that um, can be assigned uh, to the emerging technologies with large scale storage. And why this technology is very interesting? Maybe audience, you know that uh, through uh, if we have generation of electricity through wind energy, it is the low voltage electricity. And if we will uh, use this intermediate li uh, liquid and storage and regasification, finally we can generate electricity with high voltage. It's already different kind of electricity that can be used for um, industries. Next slide, please. Yeah, another uh, technology is very interesting. This is uh, purely developed in Germany, call it power to X. So if we have electricity, including renewable electricity, and we at one period of time, we have access of electricity, no need to store it. It makes sense to use this electricity for some conversion processes, generate chemical substances, and after that, use these chemical substances to generate electricity or for some other applications. Next slide, please. Yeah, uh, power to X concept was developed uh, more than 10 years ago. First started uh, to as concept for storage of renewable energy, but now it is the concept of storage of excess electricity. So if we have base load and during the night we can produce uh, a lot of electricity, we can do something with this electricity and stabilize the grid because stabilization of electrical grid, it is very important to show. That's why we would like this grid to be smart. Next slide, please. Yeah, what means power to X? Power, it is uh, electrical energy, exclusively electrical energy that will be generated using any way, including um, also uh, renewable energy. Uh, uh, two, it means that it will be conversion process, energy conversion process uh, that required a lot of electrical energy 
for this conversion process. And X, it is new positive effect that we can generate out of that. The idea of power of 2X, it should be only large scale transformation. Power to X, small scale, doesn't make sense. Next slide, please. Yeah, and uh, the basic idea of power to X, we have electricity, we can use water electrolysis, we will have hydrogen. And after that, with hydrogen, we can generate any other chemical substances. We can use hydrogen as a pure substance. We can uh, produce ammonia. We can produce methanol. And we can produce synthetic methane. And I saw already somewhere uh, in the chart, someone asked if we can use CO2 for production of fuels. Power to X, it is exactly this option. With an electrical energy using electrolysis, we will produce hydrogen. And after that, CO2 plus hydrogen, we can generate methane. And for example, Thyssen Group uh, company said that power to X, it is a very good technology because can help to avoid battery storage because electrical battery storage, we already mentioned in large scale, this concept doesn't work. But if we have power to X, we don't need large scale battery storage. Next slide, please. Yeah. And um, I already mentioned that this concept is developed in uh, Germany, the German concept, and still it, it is up to technological readiness level 6, 7. We have some applications, but not full uh, industrial scale application. And here uh, in the on this slide, you can see how many publications, reports, and research exist in this field. Of course, Germany is leading because this concept is developed um, in Germany. This is just for, for the statistical data information. Next slide, please. Yeah, thank you. And my research group is also working in the field of power to X. Uh, we recently published uh, the paper, and this is uh, um, information from this paper. We uh, exclusively for Germany, because prices of electricity are very high, we evaluated for uh, four options. What is better for uh, energy? To produce hydrogen and liquefy hydrogen, and after deal with liquid hydrogen, to produce methanol, to produce ammonia or to produce small amount of hydrogen and mix it this with the natural gas. And all options, as you can see, uh, production, distribution, emission, safety, toxicity. So everything was included in the evaluation. And final conclusion was that for Germany, for the prices of electricity, methanol and ammonia are quite comparable. And sometimes ammonia is the winner for Germany, but for for each other country, conclusion can be different. So as you can see, this is one of the emerging technologies that can be used for the large scale application. Next slide, please. Yeah, we are coming to the conclusion, and we already mentioned uh, all these advantages and disadvantages of these technologies. And mainly, we would like to achieve not only zero emission energy sector, entire production and con uh, consumption, but we also would like to have sustainable. So it means that it should be not only efficient, but also um, environmentally friendly and economically feasible. So next slide, and with next slide, I will tell you thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you very much, Thank Tatiana. you very much, Tatiana. Sorry, there's an echo. Uh, our next presenter is, uh, just a second, uh, is Dr. Joe Havemann, uh, a scientist uh, by education and uh, in de evolutionary developmental biology and currently a trainer and consultant in openly scholarly communication research project management. She is the, also the co-founder and coordinator at Africa Archive, a uh, publishing platform to increase this, the discoverability of African uh, research accomplishments with a focus on uh, digital tools for science and her label access to perspectives. She aims at strengthening global inclusive science communication and research management through the adoption of open science. 
practices. Thank you, Victoria. Um, okay, so basically the connection to Tatiana's presentation is mostly that we rely on energy and also connectivity as an as a second level of um, resource and infrastructure. And for the services that we um, provide with open science practices generally, and then open access publishing um, specifically or more specifically, and what I'll be presenting today is a repository that we've built over five years now and are now transitioning towards Africa and on African hosted um, facilities. Let me share my screen to do that. So together with me on that slide, so you find my contacts um, and also Professor Madara Gart, he's uh, the CEO or the director of UbuntuNet Alliance, which is an um, NREN, a regional um, national, no, regional education research network. So they provide uh, connectivity. So basically provide digital infrastructure for research and education institutions in the whole of Southern and Eastern Africa. It's basically half the continent. And we're working now together to establish Africa Archive on the continent as Africa hosted, African owned repository for African research to be um, disseminated and to be made discoverable using digital infrastructure and international standards and um, services. So our mission is to make African research discoverable together. So it's all a collaboration um, with the theme of today's webinar with um, SDG 17 um, to work together to achieve all of the SDGs. And we focus primarily on SDG 4, which deals with um, education and research and knowledge um, generation and dissemination. And um, the phrase that we just saw in English, you can also say in Swahili because Madara Gratz um, is Kenyan. So, Wachatufanya Utafiti wa Kiafrika Kugundulika Kwa Pamoja. Um, it's basically the same that you just heard in English. I'm mentioning that because multilingualism is also important to us. And we feel that, or I personally also as a trainer for open science communication, feel that um, to be able to consume, but also produce knowledge as a researcher or as a recipient um, of the knowledge generation in your own language is essential. Um, and therefore we allow submissions by researchers in any language, primarily the ones spoken on the continent. Um, yeah, and also our website or the front page for now is accessible through the languages that Google Translate um, supports um, that are spoken on the continent, which, is, which includes English, French, Arabic, and Portuguese, but also many um, traditional African languages. So that's our main page. The, so we're building solutions that are tech-based and rely on the internet and therefore also energy supply um, for the remaining challenges that African research keeps facing, which is for one's language barriers, the digital visibility of African scholarly output. So the bulk of the research accomplishments is not discoverable because there is no assignment of dig digital features, which then enable the detection by search engines such as Google Scholar um, to display the results. Um, there's also a general complaint by international research consortia and associations that African scholars are underrepresented, and that's due to the um, low visibility and as well as uh, restricted access to research funding. And where by increasing discoverability, we're aiming towards um, providing now these benefits that we mentioned here to researchers, publishers, and libraries in Africa alike, including reputation building, networking and capacity building, networking opportunities and capacity building, uh, so infrastructure-wise and also um, conceptually. Um, so we provide trainings and webinars on publishing um, using digital means and um services and all of that to again just 
increase discoverability of research output, primarily through the indexing of scholarly content coming from Africa in um, in international and um, international repositories or according to international publishing standards by assigning the so-called DOIs, digital object identifiers, which enable discoverability digitally and open licensing to ensure um, uh, ownership of the research accomplishments to remain with the African scholarly community or in particular the originating authors. So you see a snapshot of um, like our submission portal, so to say, that you find on the website. We have so far, um, we launched in 2018 and we have launched with the Open Science Framework, but, um, which is um, located in the United States and run by um, the Center for Open Science. Um, and then diversified using also Papa, Figshares, and Nodo. Um, yeah, and there. And um, and all of these are of highest um, digital standard and international publishing standards. Um, so and we just ensure quality assure uh, quality by having in place a moderation process, and thereby encourage researchers to submit their work. Uh, and also um, providing the opportunity to, to make it digitally discoverable. Um, so here you see a bit of a schema. So the left-hand side is um, the, re sorry, the remotely hosted services that we have worked with so far and continue to work with. But now we're setting up a centrally hosted repository which is um, Ubuntu Net Alliance is hosted in Malawi and we're using their service, servers, which are located in Zambia and Uganda to set up open source technology or software to now build, uh, and that's basically ready to go. So we will launch the campaigns for adoption in early 24. Um, and then expand into other open source services to build capacity across the continent to allow for diversity also of digital infrastructure. And um, because many of these systems are already in place to some extent, but because of the institutional readiness or the lack thereof and the um, gaps in the infrastructure development in many parts of the continent, we are now um, of in, um, providing services to for the institutions to leverage, to work with us, to tap into newest technologies and update the ones they already have and developing and sharing workflows that are easy to manage, um, not to exhaust the budgets and resources that are accessible and available. And so I have just launched last month in Uganda, the new platform. And I just want to share a word or two about Diamond Open Access. Those of you who are familiar with the publishing processes and open access generally, there's now a misconception that gold open access is the only way forward where now researchers have to pay to publish. Before there was a majority of research output where readers had to pay to read. And then there was, a, or still is ongoing a movement on the call for um, liberating research outputs and diamond open access is not charging the readers nor the submitting researchers to, for, to, for publishing, but there's other means of um, sponsorship and financial support to um, continue the serve or to, to maintain the services. It's just highly underused. So we want to advocate for the adoption of diamond open access and it's not, I think, like personally as a biologist by training, <laughs> as um, was pointed out by Victoria, um, I believe in the in the system or I don't know if it's a system, I believe in diversity, generally speaking, because diversity just um, allows for a lot of resilience in any system, technologically as well as biologically. So in any ecosystem, if you have a diversity of animal and plant species, um, any drama or um, scenario can happen, the majority of the 
of the living organisms will still survive. If you rely on only a few or just one, as we see with crop and um, agriculture, um, it's a very fragile system, even if it produces a lot of yield, but then you just need one drought and the whole um, harvest is uh, spoiled. So diversity is key. So therefore we want to strengthen diamond open access, but still, um, but not necessarily abolish other forms of um, open access and publishing workflows because it's always good to have a mix of, of um, practitioners and also to, to be agile and to be responsive to whatever happens with economies as we move forward in time as a global society. Okay, so there is various institutions and organizations and workflows already in place, which can be leveraged upon to support them and open access in Africa in particular, but also on a global scale. And we are currently um, uh, on a grant by ORCID, which is one of the key digital infrastructures for scholarship and publishing and for research and support, which uh, allows us to also build capacity in the region for um, the adoption of open science practices and persistent identifiers such as DOIs, ORCID, and ROAR for institutions. And we um, have an ongoing webinar series on open science to which you are cordially invite invited. You'll find it on our website, africarchive.org, and then there's a, um, a tab for webinars where you can find the upcoming featured organizations and services that we have lined up into 24. And we have still three, I think, this year. So just to conclude, these are the scholarly principles and recommendations we base our work on, um, which is all, yeah, and we work closely also with the UNESCO office in Paris that specialize or that has developed the globally inclusive UNESCO, uh, recommendations on open science. And um, these are our partners, project funders, and yeah, you can reach out to us anytime to let us know if you have any questions or see opportunities to work together to make African research more discoverable, but also um, research globally inclusive for publishing. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. That was wonderful. Uh, I like how you're shifting the perspective from local, national to more global inclusive and not just shifting, but facilitating uh, the in infrastructurally uh, uh, those that cannot afford to to put the research uh, at the front uh, of mm -hmm. the global audience. So thank you. Uh, and our last presentation is from um, our partner uh, Senti. Uh, Monica, who is uh, head of marketing, will give us an overview how collaboration between key stakeholders in open access can support the dissemination of co of uh, content in underserved uh, communities. Monica, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Victoria. And thank you also to Joe and Tatiana for those interesting presentations. Um, just one moment while I adjust. Uh, Victoria, we can move to the next slide. Thank you. Um, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining this webinar. It's a pleasure to be here and to talk about all things accessibility, discoverability, and also introduce you to Zendi. Uh, so for those who have not come across Zendi before, Zendi is an AI powered uh, research library. Um, it was founded in 2019 with a mission to make scholarly literature more affordable and more accessible. Uh, fast forward to today, Zendi hosts over 400,000 users from 200 countries and territories around the world. Uh, and largely our user profiles include students, uh, researchers and professionals. Uh, we work very closely with 
uh, world-class publishers, uh, such as the wonderful team at Intech Open, uh, to really increase the discoverability and accessibility of open access content. Now, in regions where open access is either not available or as ready, readily accessible, uh, we do form partnerships to make paid content uh, more affordable. Uh, we do this through our affordable access um, plan, and this gives uh, our users a legal alternative to pirated content. And uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Okay, so let's talk about partnerships for accessibility and discoverability. Um, so the key ways that we contribute to accessibility and discoverability includes expanding our reach in underserved regions, um, the expansion of our OA catalog. And one example of that is also uh, the inclusion of InTech open books on the Zendi platform. And also the uh, discoverability of both open access and affordable access uh, content via our channels. Uh, we work very closely with all stakeholders in the publishing spectrum. And this is important to us. Um, for the, um, sorry, I just wanna make sure, can you, am I audible? Because I just saw a couple of comments. I can hear you clearly, so. Okay, sorry, sorry to those uh, listeners who are having an issue with the audio. Um, hopefully we can rectify that. Okay, so going back to partnerships for accessibility and discoverability. Um, so we expand the reach of OA content, we improve accessibility where it's needed most, and we accelerate the discovery of knowledge. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so how do we make content more discoverable? Uh, first and foremost, we work with publishers. Uh, this is one of the examples of how we make content discoverable. We partner with publishers to hold joint webinars. We do uh, social media campaigns with publishers and we also collaborate with them for conference proceedings. Uh, another key way that we make content discoverable is that we have the ability to focus our marketing efforts in different regions based on the needs of a certain provider or publisher. For example, if there is a publisher or content provider who wants to reach a specific region, for example, Nigeria, uh, we can help facilitate that through our platform and the reach that we have in those regions. Uh, we also work with publishers based on analytics that we generate from our user base. So an example of that is we may be able to collaborate with a publisher who wants to reach a niche audience who have a specific interest in a niche topic. Um, and of course, we leverage the best technology to enhance discoverability. Uh, technology is really sitting at the core of solving some of the accessibility uh, and discoverability issues that currently exist. And we're hyper-focused right now on building a super easy to use platform um, that is impactful both for publishers and also for end users who are essentially the readers of this research content. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so one of the key ways that we're using technology right now is harnessing the power of AI. So currently, uh, of course, as many of you would know and are reading about, um, ease of use is becoming synonymous with the immeasurable capacity that AI has. Uh, this year, we've launched a range of tools that we've designed to facilitate a smooth discovery experience for our readers. Some of those tools include AI summarization, which generates an on-demand summary of very lengthy research papers that allows read readers to streamline their literature review process and uh, dissect large amounts of research in a shorter amount of time. Uh, we also have keyword highlighting, um, which allows users to highlight key concepts in research papers. And this really aids in discovery as it allows people to identify additional concepts to explore and then continue their research in that way. And last but not least, um, we have been working hard on a LLM model, 
uh, that is trained in-house with our own data. So that model can answer research questions about key concepts and then also recommend further reading for research papers that will um, help in the discovery of new research. And we really believe that this is going to be a, a pivotal tool that will help further accelerate discovery. In addition, with our LLM model, we can actually customize data sources to fit the needs of different institutions or corporations, should they want to um, have a model of their own that's customized with their content. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. So this uh, we think is super important because the um, the analytics that we generate about our readers truly help us assess whether our efforts uh, that we put into discoverability and accessibility are making an impact. Um, what we can see through our data is a very large percentage of our readers come from the developing world. And a key part of our mission is to make content available and discoverable to readers outside of the established publishing world. Now, a lack of funding for these readers mean uh, one of a few things. It means that perhaps they cannot attend a, a university or are attending a university which is chronically sort of funded in, in terms of their institutional um, budgets. Now, lack of funding also means that readers have to look at alternative access met methods. And it can't go without saying that some of these methods include pirated websites. We're very aware of that. And the whole purpose of Zendi, especially in these regions, is to provide a trustworthy search platform, which provides um, sort of uh, access to content in a legal and credible way. Um, it's also worth noting, and this is something we've found interesting, is that we do have a growing audience of readers from developing countries. Um, and uh, an example of that could be the US. Uh, some analytics we ran recently show us that we do have some readers who are in the US, but they're attending smaller institutions um, where, whereby they have limited or uh, low quality access to library databases. So we can really see through our data that on a global scale, um, there is a quite significant issue related to accessibility and discoverability. And the work that we are doing today, um, we hope will have a very lasting impact on, on a sustainable tomorrow. And we truly believe in a world where equality of access is a real thing and not just a pipe dream. So no matter where you live, no matter where you work, no matter where you study, uh, the future of Zendi is really to be a home where you can come and find the research you need um, for a more knowledgeable tomorrow. So I will conclude with those statements. Um, and I thank you so much for your time. Uh, looking forward to any questions you have. And I will paste a couple of links in the comments section so you can explore Zendi. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. Uh... I would like to, I see that the uh, chat and Q&A uh, are very much active, but because we are running out of time, we will answer those questions that have not been answered already uh, through email. All presentations and slides will be available uh, on our uh, webpage and we will hand out the uh, uh, participation certificates to the to the uh, participants as well. Um, I think that I would like to add just one uh, very important aspect that encompasses all presentations and uh, that, that is a call for responsible research and research integ integrity from the initial idea to publishing and uh, responsibly uh, reusing it. Uh, once again, thank you, thank to all uh, panelists uh, for their wonderful presentations. Uh, I would like to conclude um, uh, this webinar um, with with a it's not a punchline, but a mission, and that is we should constantly ask ourselves: Are we doing enough in connecting all parties involved? 
in the scholarly uh, communication ecosystem in achieving the sustainability and in our everyday activities, we should ask ourselves, are we doing enough for equity and sustainability? Can we be, can we do better? Can we be uh, more efficient in order to reach at least the majority of sustainable development goals, if not all by, by 2030 and beyond? We should think even uh, beyond. Uh, thank you again for your time. Uh, it's been a real pleasure.